Hey guys, welcome back. This is another Rock Crusher video. Um, I'm sort of playing with new formats for sort of project videos. Uh, there's four major parts to a project. So there's designing it, there's machining it, assembling it, and then kind of the reveal video. I've already done the assembly and reveal video, so I'm kind of hoping to go over the design and some of the machining footage. So, you know, this is still just uh, trying out new stuff. Let me know if you like this format or not, but yeah, let's get into it. First part we're going to talk about is the jaw faces. I had a bunch of questions on this anyways. Uh, so the material is actually 4140, so that's a low carbon chromoly steel. Um, nominally it's hardenable. I tried my very best to harden it, but it didn't go so well. You'll see the footage anyways, but um, I actually machined these. I started with a solid bar and I machined these with a mill drill, which is like a sort of like a pointed end mill. Now that is not sort of the ideal way of going about machining these. I think the best way to machine these probably would have been to have a double angle cutter and go down the side like this. Alternately, you could have positioned it at sort of 45 degrees like this and you could have done like a staircase thing with a normal square end mill. Um, I just wanted to try the drill mill and honestly it worked super well, so I'm fairly happy with it. Uh, we have a whole bunch of mill drills at my work that are sort of beat up, but you hate to throw them out, right? So, I mean, Mill drills be used for chamfering sometimes, and uh, so they'll get worn out in certain spots, and you know, the touch off kind of breaks the tip sometimes, and, and they're still good cutting tools, they're just, uh, you know, not good enough for, for actual work. So I use beat up tools all the time, but yeah, this, uh, this actually worked out fairly well. So chromoly steel, 4140 especially, um, it is hardenable. You can harden it, I think, to Rockwell 35-ish, which isn't super hard, but I tried my best anyways, and I didn't get it particularly hard. So if you look at this from the side, you can see the peaks are actually kind of flattened from the rock. Uh, I don't think I got this as hard as I would have liked. So when I did harden this, I heated it up to about 850 Celsius, I believe, and then I quenched it in old motor oil. The problem I had is that I quenched it in a fairly small amount of motor oil, and then I left it in. So, you know, you don't want to deal with super hot metal, so I just kind of left it in the oil bath and said, no one go near this. With such a small amount of oil though, um, it probably heated up quite a bit with these two, you know, red hot pieces of metal going into it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it got up to like 300 Celsius and leaving it for an hour would probably ruin the hardness on these guys. So these aren't really that hard. You'll also notice that this, I didn't really make any real effort to get the uh, scaling off and I didn't even make a huge effort to deter scaling. It's not a cosmetic part whatsoever and um, I sort of had a limited window where I could use the furnace. so. I decided just to go for it. All right, so that's the jaw faces. Now, the jaws are designed so that when they line up, they sort of interweave like this. And it's actually really interesting. Um, I think what it's supposed to do is it puts sort of three points of force going through the rock and it makes a shear plane and breaks it like that. Uh, some people were asking why it's not sort of stippled or the, the grooves don't go the other way. And I think it's just so you still get that force concentration but the material still flows fairly freely down the middle. So these are what I'm calling the jaws here. Um, so this is a sort of a fixed jaw and uh, that'll get a jaw face on it. Uh, one of these is thinner, the moving one's thinner. So yeah, so that'll go on like that. This is certainly the more interesting jaw. So this is um, mild steel, 836. It's hot rolled. Um, nothing special about this part. I basically just went in from the side and contoured it and then I flipped it around and sort of matched it up the best I could. It's a rock crusher, it's not cosmetic, I probably didn't match it perfectly, but you know, I sort of sanded it to look a little nicer. So the last step was just to go in from the back and sort of do this pocket here and drill those holes. Now, I had originally planned to do a smaller radius here, and if I zoom in, you can actually see um, where the end mill cut versus where the chamfer mill cut. Chamfer mill did what it was supposed to do. Um, I wasn't thinking, so I didn't get sort of the proper radius on that. And because of that, there's actually a small interference with the mating part. Wasn't a huge deal, I just, you know, hollowed out part of the, uh, the mating part. 
uh, this part here actually so you can see I hollowed that out there and that uh, so now that fits together like this and there's no interference because it's hollowed out. Uh, I drilled this through for a dowel pin to go in. I just wanted to use a dowel pin because it's you know quick and easy. One thing to keep in mind with metric dowel pins is that they tend to be oversized. So uh, this is 10 millimeters in a little bit. Uh, I pressed these high load bushings in. For speeds below around 500 RPM, bushings are just fine. So I decided to use those for this. And as you can see, this is already all beat up. The paint's already all coming off, but that's totally fine. I had no intention of keeping the paint looking nice. So these jaws are actually sort of positioned a little bit like this. So gravity's coming down this way. So the fasteners want to come out the back. I use those little um, sort of circular lock washer things. I've heard mixed reviews about these. I've never had a problem with them, but some people hate them. So I don't know, grain of salt, I guess. All right, so you can see uh, once the jaw is put together, we've got this kind of pocket that's formed here. I had originally planned to do that as a pocket, but when you get to really small material thicknesses near the end, there's no point. So I just knocked it through and uh, now the rocker bar can go in there. So this is the rocker bar. This was cut out of uh, A36 mild steel as well. Um, it was just contoured from one side with uh, you know, the Tormac or whatever. <laughs> Um, I pressed in a W1 shaft and I also pressed in some oil light bushings so this doesn't come apart anymore. It's all pressed together, it was painted like this. To assemble it you just put uh, the rocker bar in position and then you push this rocker pin in. Um, oh, that's such a good fit. Anyways, um, like I discussed in the previous video, this is just held in place with set screws. I got no problem using set screws here. If they fall out, they fall out. This bar isn't going anywhere. And if it does, it'll just stall the machine. Nobody gets hurt, not a big deal. I think when I put this together to do uh, larger runs, I'm probably going to Loctite these guys. In addition to asking about the jaws, a lot of people also asked about the crankshaft and how it was made, what it's made out of. So because the crankshaft actually has to fit through this bushing, um, I had to machine it in multiple pieces. So these are actually two end pieces that look a lot like this. Well, they look just like this. These are 1045 steel, so they're sort of a, a mid-carbon steel. They're hardenable, though I didn't harden them. And they're pretty good choice for drive shafts and gears and things like that. If this were a bigger build, what I could have done actually is put a split bushing on the back here, and then I could have made this all as one solid piece. Uh, I think that's much more common in industry. They'll use like a forged crankshaft. They'll have a split bushing that mates with it, and then they can just put it together as one piece. As it happens, I didn't have that luxury, so it's a multiple piece crankshaft. You can see that there's some dimples here. Now, I'm deeply ashamed of these parts. These parts came out horribly. Um, I'm not going to try to hide that. You can see that um, this looks absolutely mangled and some of those are set screw dimples but a lot of these came off the machine like this and I have no idea why. I don't know if they had set screw dimples stressed into them or something before and when I cut it I just revealed them but they came off the machine looking like this. Anyways if anyone has any ideas why that would have happened I'd be keen to know because I've never encountered anything like that before. Back to putting this together. Um, I had originally planned to drill this all the way through and use roll pins to uh, pin the shaft together. But I discovered as I had this all clocked and I was drilling it that this is actually case hardened. So it ate my drill bit alive. And then I went in after it with a an old carbide end mill and it ate that alive too. Uh, I mean, that's just because of the geometry. That wasn't because carbide can't cut case hardening. But um yeah, it turns out I made a, a pig's ear of that, so now I've got this kind of dimpled set screw thing going on here. I think it would have been a lot better to use a roll pin. You would have got a double shear situation instead of this kind of... This is this is a set screw and shear, and that's not the way they're supposed to work. They're supposed to work using, like, a friction fit. Uh, 
and yeah, this is a. Uh, if this breaks, I won't be surprised, but I also won't be afraid to fix it because it's not a hard part to make. Uh, I'll show you some footage of making it, but yeah. Now, because these both were separate parts, I had to clock these in together. So what I ended up doing is I actually had this all assembled and I put this in the three jaw chuck and I was rotating it and I was actually measuring the run out on the opposite side. And I basically corrected it manually until the run out was minimal. And then I marked it and drilled it right away. So these are running to within two thou, which I think is fine for this application. Uh, the bearings have a little bit of give in them anyways. So yeah, like I said, not worried. I think this might have been one of the worst parts I've ever made. Oh. Alright, so that's that aside for now. Next up is going to be the body. So the body is made of half inch A36 steel. Uh, you can see paint got mangled. Don't care. It's paint for rust resistance and I'm not even holding my breath for that. You can see we've got one oil light bushing pressed in on the two sides and that's for the uh, rocker pin to go in. I actually I went to metal supermarkets to get this metal and they had an off cut that was three quarter inch thick and it was you know a couple bucks cheaper than the half inch thick stuff so I was like oh yeah I'll go for the three quarter stuff and just mill it down. That turned out to be a ridiculous decision because I ended up water jetting these parts out and when you add a little bit of thickness you actually add a fair amount of cost so any money I would have saved from you know like buying thicker material that happened to be an off cut I definitely lost in water jetting so that was kind of stupid. Anyways, um, I think a smarter person would have gotten some thick wall rectangular tubing and sort of tweaked their design around that. I didn't have any thick wall tubing, so I went with the half inch steel. All right, so you can see because of the boxy shape how a smarter man probably would have gone with rectangular tube. Um, this is a funny little order of assembly thing. You've actually got to put the, uh, the moving jaw in before you put the whole housing together. Uh, I did leave myself a bit of room to assemble it from the side, so strictly speaking, um, this hole is large enough to push the two sides of the crankshaft through, and I've got an access hole on this side, and that is enough to install the rocker pin. I didn't end up doing that, um, no particular reason there, I mean there's tool access isn't amazing, so probably could have drilled some holes up here for the set screws or something, but it's just easier to do it this way. So now we've got that in. Now that that's in, I can just put this other side on. And that goes on, same as the first side. <sighs> You'll notice I've lathered everything in WD-40. That's because I don't want it to rust and I don't know what I'm doing with rust protection. I actually never paint stuff, uh, but I decided to paint this because I figured it would give me a fighting chance against rusting. It's just mild steel, so this will rust if you look at it the wrong way. Um, Still, still noticing a bit of rust. I think it might be from the 4140, but the life cycle on this is pretty limited. I'm going to use this to crush some granite. If it turns out to be a great idea, maybe I'll make a new one. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll also probably service this thing until it's ground down to nothing. Another funny quirk about the housing is you'll notice these are actually 3 eighths of an inch. We just happen to have off cuts that are basically this exact size, um, but 3 eighths of an inch. So I just drilled some holes in and I was like, there we go, we're all done. But I didn't leave myself enough room for the counter bore head, so I sort of had to hollow them out like this. That's all fixed in the Patreon drawings, which are coming along, by the way. They're, it's 20 parts, so it takes a little bit of time, but yeah, I'm certainly working on those almost every night. So. So I also put a bunch of extra holes in here. This was originally for a nameplate, and on the other side, that was originally for um, mounting the motor. Turns out I was a little preemptive when it came to mounting the motor. It turns out that it was best to mount it on a base. Um, and the nameplate would have been awesome. I would have loved to do one of those brass nameplate things, but it's totally covered over by the flywheel or the pulley. So basically pointless. So I, I did my little graffiti tag here, but yeah, that would have been sick. Now, oh, well.
these are the flange bearing housings. Uh, a few people have been kind enough to point out these are not actually called pillow blocks. These are pillow blocks, it's just the shape, I guess. Um, I have this bad habit of calling any cast iron bearing housing a pillow block. It's wrong, but I do it for some reason, so if by any chance I make that mistake again, that's what I mean. As I said in the previous video, the standard pillow block size for this is way too big. You could make it work. I think I actually used the proper hole spacings as well. You just have to make the shaft longer. You'd have to run the pulley further off. Uh, it wasn't ideal for me, so I decided not to do it. The other thing is that these are ball bearings, but bushings would have worked totally fine here too, because we're only at 450 RPM. So those just press on like that. All right, so I've got these bearing blocks kind of loosely screwed on, and now I'm gonna show you how I go about aligning them. So you see this is pretty nice the way it is, right? And that's because there's some compliance in the system. The bearing blocks are free to move. Anytime it needs to move out of the way, it does. Um, so what I'm going to start doing is incrementally tightening these. One of them, basically I'm gonna tighten first, and I'm going to force the mechanism through its rotation, and that'll actually force the other bearing to find its sort of optimal position. So that feels pretty good. I'm going to tighten it a little bit there. Please forgive me using one of these things. Um, I'm not very responsible and I can't seem to keep a set of Allen keys together. I'm actually looking into doing a project for one of these where I sort of make it larger and a little less janky, I guess, but we'll see. Um, so I'm incrementally tightening this down. And as I rotate the crank through its range of motion, the loose bearing will sort of find where it wants to go. When I think it's reached sort of a good equilibrium, I'll just give it a crank on one bolt, run it through a little more, and then crank the other bolt. So the idea behind doing this is there's only one position that this is ever gonna work in. And if you sort of incrementally tighten it one side, then the other, it'll kind of work its way into that position. And then you crank stuff down to lock it in position. Uh, one thing I've noticed with this design is that these fasteners tend to want to work loose, uh, which makes sense. The entire reactive force of crushing the rock goes that way through the bearings, so there's sort of a fairly great impetus for them to want to shift. Um, I think I'm going to Loctite those when I do a larger run of rocks. So now that we have the crankshaft back together, I'm going to put the fixed jaw in. This just slides in. Um, that was one kind of tolerance thing I had to make sure was correct. Did I slide that in the wrong way? I think I might have. No, I didn't. So, yeah, that slides in like that. And then I've got um, these shoulder screws. Now, the original plan for this was I tighten the shoulder screw. The shoulder screw applies a lot of force through the washer and grips this surface um, just with friction. And that holds the whole assembly in place. That would never have worked. The forces are too high. I'm not sure what I was thinking, but it so happens that if you tighten the shoulder screws enough, it'll actually pinch the entire housing shut, and that's what holds everything in place. So that's a much better sort of approach to this, I think. Um, there is a correct side for the head versus the nut. The head, remember, you have to access with an Allen key, so you stick out a little more, so that's got to be on the pulley side. Whereas the nut side goes on the flywheel side because you can reach in behind the flywheel with a wrench. I mentioned in the last video I actually redesigned this for uh, hex bolts on the, the Patreon drawings because there's no reason these should be shoulder screws. Um, I'll also have the corresponding tolerance for the, uh, I guess, the width of these parts which defines the width of the whole thing. Alright, so that's in position. I just got to think back and I got to make sure I got this all on the right side. So this is the pulley. Okay, so this is actually backwards. And when I'm ready to adjust this, um, I'm just going to use a, I'll use a wrench and an alley key and I just counter rotate these and that actually locks it pretty well in position. Uh, so I can sort of adjust for different aggregate sizes. Um, honestly, it can only crush sort of inch and a half sized rocks and smaller. So um, these slots probably don't have to be that long, but here we are. This is another good time to tell you about, um, I actually made some covers for the ends of these just to keep the grit out. 
Uh, they're super ugly looking, and that's why I didn't show them earlier, but they just uh, sort of fit on like this. They're just laser cut plastic. Um, if by chance anyone out there makes one of these, I would love to see these in like brass. That would look really nice. Brass and maybe recontoured, redesigned a bit. All right, so that should keep gunk out of the pivots at least, at least a little bit. Um, there's also a cover that goes over top here, and uh, that supposedly stops gunk from getting in here, but I'm starting to realize that keeping crap out of this thing is a lost cause. Uh, you can just see how dirty the surface is. Maybe white paint wasn't a good decision, I don't know. Anyways, that's that put together. Next up, we are going to talk about the flywheel. So, first thing you'll notice is that it's not an exercise weight. It's actually a disc of 1045, which is so much nicer to machine than an exercise weight. I, I cannot stress that enough. Um, you can see it started rusting a bit. That's, that's like I had my back turned for a second and I got some rust patches on it, but I cleaned most of them off now anyways and, you know, soaked it in WD-40. That's how I do. Um, so why would I use a flywheel for a build like this? Uh, flywheels are actually designed to store rotational energy and give it back when it's needed. So they're often used in applications where the load or the supplied power has a varying torque. You can see here that 80% of the shaft rotating has nothing to do with crushing rocks. It's just this little bit here. So what the flywheel lets you do is it lets you add energy to the system and store it while it's not actively crushing rocks. And then it suddenly releases the energy and seems to give you more power. It gives you more power over the crushing stroke. Uh, same amount of energy though. Uh, you'll also recognize flywheels from vehicles. In a four-stroke engine, uh, the cycle is suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Ugh, demonetized. The energy only comes in from the bang, so the flywheel actually has to carry the mechanism through the other three stages. So that's what a flywheel does in that application. Um, in this application, you're only crushing rocks for a small part of it. The flywheel charges energy when it's not actively crushing rocks and then dissipates it when it's crushing rocks. It's kind of like a capacitor, but mechanical. I knew I was going to need a flywheel in this application, although I had no idea how big. You can actually calculate how big of a flywheel you need uh, by finding the equivalent moment of inertia required to store enough energy at the average angular velocity to exceed the integral of the torque with respect to time. <gasps> There's an equation. I'm going to go over flywheels in a lot more detail in a mechanical design video because I think they're fascinating and they're super useful. It's actually not as hard as it sounds. It turns out this is as big as I wanted to go, so I just made this and hoped it would be good enough. If this wasn't good enough, I'd have to switch to a higher horsepower motor, which, you know, wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, I just knew sort of what my envelope was, so I had to work within that. Um, I think maybe in the flywheel video I'll back calculate what kind of speed variation there is and maybe I'll try to verify it with a camera. That could be interesting. So if you didn't see the video I posted a couple weeks ago, I actually tried to make a flywheel out of an exercise weight. The logic being an exercise weight is a piece of cast iron that's about the right shape and super cheap. Uh, about a dollar a pound actually. Um, it didn't work out quite as I would have hoped. Uh, the material was really, really bad, although I've since heard some really good tips from commenters. Uh, some people said to use higher quality weights. I guess some weights are made with um, steel instead of cast iron. And then also weights that don't have cutouts in them, because the cutout is sort of an anomaly in the casting process, and it's much more likely to generate voids. So I may revisit that again someday. This piece of steel was like 15 or $20, I think. So it wasn't really that expensive, although, as you can imagine, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you start getting way more expensive, so it still may make sense to try exercise weights for flywheels.
I ended up putting a bushing in this. So you can see this is an aluminum bushing fit into the center. And that's because I wanted to put some kind of a set screw through here. Lots of problems with set screws in this application. We'll get to it. Um, the problem is you can't drill and tap a hole this deep. Uh, at least I can't. So I needed a hub. And to make a hub, I would have had to have a lot thicker material. So instead, I decided to use a bushing. These bushings actually do exist in industry as well, except they're normally tapered. Uh, so you can buy a bushing and machine your own part, and they'll sort of align themselves. So I might have gotten concentricity on this part, but you certainly can't take it apart and put it back together because then you would lose concentricity. So this just goes on um, the shaft like this, set screw aligns with the D shape. The D shape is there just to stop the set screw from slipping, um, which is a problem with set screws because set screws are not precise and they don't hold a lot of load. They're really just convenient. So I used one out of necessity, I guess, because I didn't have a brooch the right size or whatever. Best thing to use here would be a key um, or a, a woodruff key or something like that but I didn't happen to have one, so here we are. Uh, haven't had any problems yet. I'm anticipating certainly uh, shearing the screw off at some point, or, well, we'll see, I don't know. It's stainless, which is even worse, so. Stainless fasteners are about as strong as aluminum, so it's a pretty poor choice for a set screw. Anywho, that's how the flywheel goes on. Uh, all right, there we go. J-section pulleys, totally my favorite. I think this is the same pulley system as a serpentine belt on a car. So it's basically a V pulley that's got lots of little grooves in it. You can actually cut these grooves with a 40 degree form tool. I'll throw those dimensions up, really good to know. The other thing you can do is you can turn them on a CNC lathe if you have a 35 degree diamond neutral tool. Uh, you've got enough clearance to turn those. So. They can handle a whole bunch of torque, and they also have a really small radius that you can bend the belt around. I've got a six groove pulley here. The astute amongst you will notice that this is only a four groove belt. It's just what I happen to have. The other, the six groove belt is in the headstock of my CNC lathe right now, so I can't really use that. This works just fine though. Um, transmits a lot of torque, I'm really happy with it. The other thing is that they're really quiet. I tried using timing pulleys once for my CNC lathe, and it sounds awful. They're really loud. You get a lot of noise when the teeth hit the pulley. So yeah, V pulleys are pretty unbelievable.
So the whole system operates in a four to one reduction. So this pulley is four times the diameter of the driving pulley. This is about four inches. The driving pulley is about one inch, a little different, but uh, that means we actually get four times the torque from the motor, but we only get a quarter of the speed, which is fine for me because really we need torque. That's, uh, that's kind of the whole purpose of gearing it down. One commenter, uh, his name is Turning Point, actually has experience with full-size crushers and he mentioned to me that I'm probably running too fast and that's why the rocks are shooting out everywhere. It took me a little bit of time to get my head around, but when I was designing, I was basically thinking, you don't have torque, so you gotta have speed, so you know, more crunches per minute or whatever will break the rocks as well. But there's a, a fatal flaw with that thinking and it actually brings up a really interesting point. Um, not everything is scalable with geometry. So just because I made a small crusher doesn't mean that acceleration due to gravity is somehow different as well. Acceleration due to gravity is constant. The speed at which the material falls back into here is constant. So really you're kind of capped off at speed. I think um, probably half this speed would be good. Uh, I get a lot of rocks kicked out. That being said, um, a lot of rocks also get crunched. It's just probably less efficient than it should be. Situations like this actually come up every now and then when you make small things like I do, so it's kind of interesting anyways. Um, not all things scale. But uh, yeah, this project's been a lot of fun. Uh, it works really well. I'm really surprised. The whole system actually fits on top of a five gallon bucket, and I can just kind of poke rocks into it, and eventually I'm going to have a bucket full of rocks. A few people have actually questioned why I wouldn't just buy rocks. That's, uh, I think that's kind of what I was poking fun at at the beginning of the last video, but the basic idea is that you really can't get small quantities of aggregate. Um, I live in a small apartment. We have a very small yard. I can't park five tons of granite anywhere. So, um, so I had to do this small scale. There's a uh, granite all over the place. In my neighborhood It's all over the sides of the road. It's what they use for sort of decorative stone, I guess. Uh, granite's also an incredibly common rock other places, so I figured I could take small pieces, crunch them down even smaller. That also begs the question, why wouldn't I just shovel up a whole bunch of it and sift out what I need? Because, you know, just the fact that it's outside means it's getting crushed all the time. Um, one big advantage to crushing your own rock is that you're actually certain of what you're getting out the other side, so if I were to shovel up a whole bunch of granite and, and sift it, I'd probably get, like, I don't know, dried dog crap and dead flies and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, at least with this, I'm sure I'm getting granite. Granite specifically is the magic ingredient in epoxy granite, so. Um, I think if I had to predict a failure on this guy, I would say probably right where the shaft joins the crank arm. Um, I've got a bad feeling about that area, so I think there's not quite enough material. There's also a stress riser, so there's a sharp corner. And, um, the 1045 actually isn't heat treated, so it, it's still pretty strong, but it's not as strong as it could be. Um, but if that's a problem, you know, if it breaks, so what? I'll make another one. <laughs> Hopefully I'll do a better job of that one. I might even try to make it out at like 8620 or something, which is about the same price as 1045, but it's, I think it's better for, um, oscillating stresses. Anywho, um, I hope you sort of enjoyed the more in-depth analysis of the Crusher. Uh, like I said, it's been a lot of fun. Plans and CAD are going to be up on my Patreon soon. It's a pretty big drawing package, so it's taking me a little longer than I'd like, but I've certainly, I've got the CAD all together now. I've got all the exploded views done. So now it should just be a matter of dimensioning it and, uh, you know, <laughs> endlessly checking it for errors. Um, I'm sure some of those get through anyways, but... Well, yeah, thanks a lot for, for joining me on this. Um, hopefully that was interesting. So I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.